Today we have part 5 of Genghis Khan, beginnings of the great Mongol nation. Super excited to dive into this one, we've only got 2 more parts left. If you guys have not seen the previous part, make sure you go check them out before you watch this one. Right, super excited, let's jump into this one, man. One year after defeating his greatest rival, Temujin Khan summoned the greatest and most important Kurultai in Mongolian history. After many days of ceremony and ritual, and many nights of celebration, Temujin is elected Khan of all Mongols. He is the great Khan now, isn't he? title for himself, Genghis Khan. Here we go! Bro, finally he's Genghis, dude. <laughs> At the age of 45, finally, Genghis Khan 45. controlled a vast territory and over one million souls. His domain stretched from the Gobi huh, Desert what? territory and over one million souls. Oh my god, he's trying to people stretched now. from the Gobi Desert in the south to the Arctic Tundra in the north. From the Manchurian forests in the east to the- Bro, I can't lie. The story of Genghis Khan is, is actually incredible. Like, how he's got to this point is mental. Altai Mountains to the west. He named his new people the Great Mongol Nation. He abolished inherited yeah. aristocratic I like that name. criminalized the abduction or enslavement of any Mongol, forbade the selling and kidnapping of women, nice. declared all children born of Mongol parents to be legitimate, and made livestock theft punishable by death. Oh, wow. He ordered the adoption of a writing system, conducted a census, and instituted diplomatic immunity and freedom of religion, exempting all religious leaders and their property. Bro, I can't lie. Genghis Khan, like, you know, even though he's like, you know, He's seen as like a great ruler and conqueror, right? He's also a nice fucking guy, bro. He's a, he's an absolute W of a leader. He really taxation is. Taxation and public service. Eventually, he extended this tax exemption to anybody who provided essential public services, including undertakers, doctors, lawyers, teachers, and scholars. With the nomadic tribes united and Genghis Khan established as their leader, his next step wasn't clear. He had spent so many years locked in conflict with Jamaka and Ong Khan that now his enormous tribe lacked a mission. So he turned his gaze beyond the steppe and engaged in a series of raids against the Tangut Empire in what is now Western China. Unlike the nomadic oh, steppe shit. Tribes, is this the Tangut had walled cities, moats, and fortresses. Their armies were nearly twice the size of Genghis Khan's. In these campaigns, he had to adopt new methods of warfare oh, to adapt shit. to these conditions. He quickly learned classic siege techniques, such as cutting off his enemy's food supply, but soon began experimenting with new tactics. On one raid, he attempted to divert a nearby river to flood the city. Despite scant experience in engineering, what? the Mongols did succeed in diverting the river, the but fuck? they wiped out their own camp instead of the Tangut. <laughs> They survived their mistake, though, and went on to conquer oh the city. My God. And with every siege, the Mongols would learn and eventually become experts at devastating enemy cities. Until this point, not many people outside of Mongolia had taken much notice of the upstart barbarian chief or his newly proclaimed nation. This was about to change. In 1210, when Genghis Khan was 48, the Jurchid nation sent a delegation from their capital city of Zhengdu, where modern-day Beijing now lies. Ong Khan had previously sworn allegiance to them, so now they came to demand the submission of Genghis Khan. Upon hearing this order, Genghis Khan turned in the direction of their nation to the south, spat on the ground, unleashed a line of insults, and then mounted his horse and rode north. See, you know what? Genghis Khan, right? He's an amazing leader if he's your leader, right? But if you're not, I, you know, you can, you can see it, bro. You can see how he's, you know, he's an absolute bitch to people around him. Leaving the stunned envoy choking in his dust. The Mongol army advanced to the south, sending squads of soldiers ahead to scout for decent pasture, seek out water sources, and report on weather conditions. Their previous raids in the Tangut Empire turned out to be a perfect practice for their campaign against their Jurchid neighbors. Desert crossings and siege warfare were now solved problems. And the Mongols had another surprising advantage. Their diet. Traditional armies traveled in long columns with massive supply trains. The Mongols, in contrast, spread out over a vast area to provide sufficient pasture for their animals, and each warrior hunted for himself or nice. carried his own individual supplies. Though dispersed, the Mongols' strict decimal organization system was diligently enforced. It's such smart. that each That's unit, smart. with its own doctors and commanders, always knew where to report and how to find what they needed. 
And because most of the Mongol army was illiterate, and communication across such a large area was critical, the officers came up with a novel solution. Orders were composed in rhyme to ensure that messages were easily memorized and repeated to each new person oh my exactly God, what as the they fuck? were originally spoken. The Mongols also launched propaganda campaigns to break the spirit of the Jurchid people, claiming that the Mongols were coming as a liberating force to free them from the oppressive royal family. More than a few Jurchid defected to join him. In the end, they found victory by transforming the Jurchid's greatest asset, their large population, into a weakness. They terrorized the countryside and conscripted local peasants, clearing out all the surrounding villages before turning their sights to the larger cities, using peasants as human shields. Rounding up an what? enemy's herds and stampeding them toward their owner's battle lines was a traditional step tactic, but- Genghis, man, I thought you was a good guy, bro. What are you doing to all these civilians in the villages, man? The Mongols modified this old classic all the by innocent. using enemy peasants instead, attacking and burning undefended villages and sending terrified peasants fleeing in all directions, clogging highways and making it difficult for the Jurchid supply caravans to move. Over the course of the campaign, more than one million refugees fled the countryside and poured into the cities, causing chaos and food shortages. The Jurchid military ended up executing tens of thousands of their own people just to what? maintain enough food stores to feed their armies. What the During fuck? this campaign, Genghis Khan discovered that Chinese engineers had developed powerful machines to batter city walls from afar. To adapt these massive war machines to fit his mobile army, he began hosting a corps of engineers on every campaign, who would camp in the forests close to target cities and cut down enough wood to build siege engines on the spot. In 1214, despite some difficulties adapting to the hot, damp climate, Genghis Khan finally besieged the capital city of Chengdu. The Jurchid had endured so much strife by then that they quickly agreed to a settlement, rather than face a prolonged siege. In return for Mongol withdrawal, the Jurchid leader, known as the Golden Khan, swore allegiance to Genghis Khan and offered massive amounts of silk, silver, gold, wow. horses, and people. As soon as the Mongols left, however, the Golden Khan and his entire royal court fled, hoping to get far enough away to escape the reach <laughs> of the Mongol army. Genghis Khan saw this as a breach of their agreement and returned to sack the capital. This time, Genghis Khan offered no opportunity to negotiate. They Why would, then, then again, he, he's only like pledged his allegiance so that he could run. His plan was to run the, the whole city entire time. According to the new Mongol law, they took absolutely everything, inventoried it, and distributed it amongst the army. As a final punishment, as the Mongol warriors retreated to their homeland, they churned up the earth behind them and trampled it with their horses. Genghis Khan wanted to ensure that the peasants never returned to their fields. Besides, this way he could convert the land to open pasture, both to feed his newly captured livestock and to allow easier access in future campaigns in the region. But in the years that Genghis Khan had been raiding abroad, trouble had begun to brew at home. Some of his most steadfast followers, the Muslim Uyghurs of the desert oases, supported him so strongly that other Uyghurs living further to the west in modern-day Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan wished to overthrow their Buddhist rulers and join Genghis Khan as well. Some sent envoys to Mongol lands what seeking an alliance, but others were under the control of Kuchlug, the son of the Naiman Khan who had harbored Jamaka. In his new position of power, Kuchluk began to persecute his Muslim subjects, forbidding the call to prayer, public worship, or Muslim religious study. Without a ruler to protect them, the Muslim Uyghurs turned to Genghis Khan to overthrow their oppressor. Although the Mongol army was thousands of miles away, Genghis Khan sent 20,000 soldiers under the command of one of his generals to defend the Muslims. And because they were engaging in this campaign at the request of their allies, this time they did not raid or loot the capital city, but instead simply defeated the army, beheaded Kuchluk, and returned home, leaving behind a herald all in a day's work to proclaim the restoration of religious freedom in the land. Most wow, importantly amazing. to Genghis Khan, this victory ensured complete control over the Silk Road between the Chinese and the Muslims. Although he didn't control the Sung Dynasty, where silk was produced, or the primary purchasing areas in the Middle East, he rerouted the twisting channels of the Silk Road into one large stream over the course of his campaign, and directed it through the Mongol steppes. So much silk passed through his land that the Mongols even started using it as a packing material. Suddenly, <laughs> life on the steppe looked very They're different too rich than it had now. before. 
Rawhide ropes were exchanged for silk cords. Fur and leather clothes were replaced with robes embroidered in silver and gold. Yurts were decorated with silk rugs, pillows, and blankets. Perfume, makeup, jewelry, board games, paper fans, incense, honey, wine, and tea became commonplace. Skilled artisans, scholars, and entertainers from across Genghis Khan's empire contributed their art, science, and culture to Mongol society. The Muslims in the region, from the mountains of modern Afghanistan to the Black Sea, produced steel, the finest of all metals, as well as cotton and glass. Genghis Khan wanted these novel luxuries also. He sent ambassadors to the Sultan with gifts, approaching not as a conqueror but as an ally, seeking an equal trade agreement. With great suspicion, the Sultan accepted. Genghis Khan sent hundreds of merchants from his newly acquired territories in caravans laden with goods to trade. As soon as the caravan entered their territory, however, a local official seized the goods and killed the merchants, completely uh -oh. unaware of uh -oh. the incredible mistake he had just made. Uh -oh. When Genghis Khan heard of this, he sent envoys to the Sultan asking him to punish the man responsible for the attack. Instead, the Sultan doubled down and killed some of the Mongol envoys, maiming the uh -oh. others and sending them back to the Khan. Genghis Khan was furious. Oh, shit. So enraged was he by this insult that he withdrew once again to his sacred mountaintop to pray and decide on a course of action. After three days of contemplation, he descended with his intentions set. The Mongols were going to war. Oh shit, is this like the Great War? Yeah, the final conquering years. This is definitely gonna be the Great War. Holy shit. How, bro, listen, listen. That guy definitely shouldn't have crossed him like that. You actually already know what's going. The great Greg Genghis card, he's gonna fuck him up. But really good video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. If you guys did, make sure to leave a thumbs up. Make sure you guys subscribe for more content. And I'll see you guys in part six.